uh hello everybody so yeah what are we gonna talk talk about today so um let's just start with a fun anecdote i was uh yesterday having a very nice hangout with uh david pierce i i sent him uh this little thing uh i made like 10 of these and uh, sent it around the world to to various people uh as gifts and also just to get feedback basically uh in uh, my exploration of uh of you know the the state space of of sense i've uh um i've encountered some like interesting things that i wanted to share with people and because of the lockdown i mean pra yeah, basically been able to only show it to very few people here and there um but um i mean in in, in the long term actually i, I do want to make kind of a line of what we might call a uh, quillia enrichment you know based on actual <laughs> really solid you know exploration of the state space of of scent it's just takes state space of uh tactile textures of visual sights and synesthetic combinations and um really there's like a lot to be shown now the particular ones that i was sending around um they weren't selected in order to give you a sense of the state space they were just selected because i thought they were cool they were like interesting interesting things that uh, came out of the research but uh and you know in this hangout it was really really cool because you know we would uh open one of these bottles put it in a scent strip and smell them maybe for like 10 minutes trying to come up with any way of describing it and you know as david david pierce was mentioning you know we really like the the semantic primitives to even talk about the vast majority of you know the notes of experience that you know ultimately compose the entirety of our experience we we really uh uh, at a loss of words for for most of these cases, and he was relaying to me an anecdote that when he was um, an Oxford student, an undergrad at Oxford, um, back in the day, he, um, uh, I mean, first of all, he was very disappointed over there because he went into yeah, you know, like a philosophy degree, expecting to actually tackle the big problems <laughs> of, of of life, the universe, and everything else, and the big questions, you know, consciousness, uh, what is the nature of well being what is you know what's the meaning of it all and uh, and instead you know at the time just natural language philosophy was thought of as the be all and all of you know stu philosophical studies you know with uh, people like uh, frege and putnam and uh, definitely wittgenstein you know just kind of trying to convince the world that philosophy was ultimately just a descriptive account of the way in which people use language and there's no real mystery on, you know <laughs> beyond that uh wittgenstein might even say that the, the the whole point of philosophy is to live life exactly as it is uh without trying to to uh make some you know additional sense of it whereas of course you know my my aesthetic and my experience is that philosophy no no completely philosophy should really be like utterly shattering your sense of reality i mean if it's not doing that i'm not sure if you're really doing philosophy so um anyhow when he was uh relating i mean i find this mind-blowing as uh him being like an undergraduate uh at oxford back in the day telling uh somebody uh in his dorm that in the future advanced intelligences might even have kind of a a full generative syntax based on sense uh you know just like this very non-trivial way of thinking like that the medium of thought that we usually have uh you know based on like for the most part like images and you know sensations and we string together uh ep you know thought episodes with semantic content and so on um there's a particular way in which we do that. There's a particular set of sensations that basically contribute to thought episodes, and a sense for the more most parts they're not there. Uh, but you know, whereas we have like this very rich generative syntax with subordinate clauses and you know all sorts of complications and and uh, additions for basically auditory experiences like how we are <laughs> experiencing language right now, there could be you know another another group of advanced intelligences or perhaps our, our actual descendants that have mastered a very generative language just based on sense and it would be its own you know universe of experience and i <laughs> i really i really think so i mean you could even even imagine it in a sense um aquilia complete you know 
super quantum computer in a sense that you know divides itself into many subcomponents and then blends with itself uh, in such a way that it explores the state space of consciousness and generates uh, vocabulary for it um, so that it doesn't fall into I suppose the private language uh, trap although there's a lot to unpack about private languages and I, I do suspect that if you have like partitioning capacities within your you know actual uh, you know brain or consciousness generating system you can kind of become a community just of your own or be, you know, a community between your partitions. You don't actually need, you know, <laughs> some other entity that is, uh, you know, disconnected, uh, not the same body as you or, you know, anyway, for the most part, humans do require others to provide critical feedback, which is absolutely essential. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I've been sending these uh, Quilly enrichment kits around. And uh, of course, um, if you if um, if you want one in the future, I may make uh, more batches, especially for you know donors and supporters and friends and people who maybe really want to kind of contribute to the to the project of exploring the state space of consciousness. Now, okay, let's get 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 into a specific a specific you know corner case, uh, which is going to be Neroli, and. Uh, this is less about like Neroli itself, although if you came here just about just to learn about Neroli, hopefully you're not going to be dissatisfied. Um, but it really is kind of an illustration of some aspects of some of the strategies that I've been using in order to explore the state space of sense uh, that hopefully generalizes to other sensory modalities and other modes of uh, basically other qualia varieties and their interactions more broadly. So... You know, a lot of people may think I'm obsessed with uh, uh, aromas and scents, maybe because I have a super intense experience of scents, and that's just not the case. I, I, I probably have a pretty average experience of scents. It's much more as a proof of concept for how, basically, if you apply the right paradigms and, and you're open-minded in the right way, you can actually say meaningful, non-trivial things about a state space that everybody just actually experience not everybody most people experience it's kind of <laughs> right beneath your nose <laughs> literally speaking and uh, uh but yeah no i mean if you do serious work eventually you actually can say real non-trivial things about it okay so what attracted me to to neroli i mean i think um my first encounter with it was actually this uh perfume it was uh, at a time where i was just buying lots of little tiny samples for uh of different perfumes and then i would just buy you know, a full perfume um, uh, of anything that I actually enjoyed a lot. And this one is one that I enjoy a lot. And and you can see it's actually the perfume I've used the most uh, by far. I consider it just like very functional. Like I can apply it on myself and do work and have meetings and makes me feel slightly better. I mean, it does have kind of a nice mood boosting quality to it. Um, and uh, I definitely noticed something interesting too, which is that, I mean, at the time I don't, I didn't know what Neroli was. I just thought it was like, maybe another flower that I just didn't know about. Um, and I did notice, you know, I would apply it. It's like, oh, wow, there's like this intense, like very, very strong character impact, but beautiful kind of citrus stop note. And then over time, it would dry out into kind of this much more like waxy character. And uh, and I didn't know which one was the Neroli. Um, and then, you know, eventually looked it up and uh, turns out that Neroli is basically what, you can get out of um, actual uh, orange uh, blossom flowers, except that it has to go through a spe specific like distillation process. And that's what distinguishes it from like basically just like orange blossom or like basically other like orange tree products. And I, I brought a, a couple examples. Like a lot of people confuse Neroli and Pettigrain. Uh, Pettigrain would be like, yeah, basically... Um, this other variety, which is uh, basically a scent produced out of the leaves and sometimes branches of the orange tree. And pedigree is really different than Neroli. To me, actually, the first time I smelled pedigree, the first thing that came to mind was uh, chamomile tea. And quite frankly, I definitely didn't consider it a kind of a natural kind. Like, I can definitely tell apart several of its notes and um, like various like herba herbaceous notes, like some like quite oily and waxy notes. But I almost got the impression that it was like almost, you know, the stamp collection is like, oh, yep, yeah, like combining, <laughs> uh, 
Combining these particular molecules have, hasn't been done in other essential oils, even though they have been present in other essential oils. It's just kind of competing this, completing the state space, so to speak. Um, Pettigrain is interesting. Is not I wouldn't say is worth that much of a of a study. At least not it wasn't for me. I mean, I've definitely always been a fan of uh, citrus smells. I have tons and tons of citrus smells. These are just some examples. Uh, I would say that, you know, mandarin, um, mandarin, you know, lemon. Um, I have lots of lemons, lots of oranges. And there's uh, some significant differences between the various like oranges. Um, but they're not that different in my experience. The various oranges... Uh, they can have kind of this uh, uh, a broad range that goes from like very sour to very sweet to very oily. But for the most part, you know, oranges, yes, yeah, overwhelmingly uh, D-limonene, the, the main contributing factors, you know, especially mandarin. Mandarin is just 90% uh, D-limonene. It's almost kind of a, I guess it's a fun fact that like, Mandarin is actually kind of a subset of <laughs> of orange, um, which I, I wouldn't have expected. I honestly thought like Mandarin really had a lot of like really unique uh, special characters. But if you actually just smell pure D-limonene and compare it to Mandarin, the difference is really, really, really mild. Um, maybe a, a little bit in the sense of uh, the entropy or the complexity of it, but uh, not that much. Um, the other thing that people confuse narrowly with is... Uh, uh, orange blossom, especially say like uh, orange blossom water, which is the water that remains from distillation of um, of uh, orange blossom flowers, and this smells very different. Actually, it smells uh, for the most part uh, kind of like traditional white flower, and you you may even think of like gardenia and tuberose. It has some of the indolic qualities, and it's not bad at all. It it actually feels like kind of like medicinal. It's not like super hedonic or anything but it's something that if you apply on yourself and like because the the content of um aromatic molecules is like relatively low i i, I don't worry about applying it on my own skin i have an experience like irritation of some sort for other perfumes by the way as an aside i actually apply them on my clothes even though that's a, you know an advice you get an advice uh from you know other family and friends like don't do that but um, you know, it's just a way in which you can guarantee that like there's none of the molecules in there are actually going to be absorbed through your skin, which I do kind of worry for some things. Uh, I don't know, coumarines and there's a lot of molecules that might be, you know, produce cancer. And uh, I'd rather just be on my clothes, you know, clothes can be changed. Um, cancer is a lot more difficult to treat. Anyway, I don't want to scare anybody who puts perfumes in their skin. You're probably fine. There's a lot of regulations making sure it's not terrible for you. All right, so those are kind of like things that are nearby, but let's get into actual Neroli. So the first Neroli that I got was this, uh, and uh, it's a very, very nice one. It's, I think, like my favorite Neroli. And when I smelled it, I realized this was like something new. You know, I had already experienced about like 100 or 150 different essential oils, and I just hadn't actually come across neroli oil it just hadn't come come into my life but when i smelled these this was the start of a new chapter in my investigations of essential oils and it's basically what allowed me to understand that there's really two very big components to the state space of scent and that is on the one hand you have kind of flavors <laughs> Uh, and that might be, I mean, like cla super strong, like clean flavors, I would say, are things such as, yeah, I mean, you know, D-limonene, valencine, you know, it's something like eogenol. Um, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. Um, you know, humulene. Um, there's like a lot of things that you smell and it's like clearly, you know, a very specific flavor. And those, you know, there's probably like hundreds and hundreds of like super flavorful molecules. And then you have this other cluster, which I call character impact. Well, I actually saw that, that term uh, in a book by Luca Turin, but I, I've seen it uh, a few other places. But uh, the way I use character impact is it's basically something that amplifies or modifies the experience of the flavors. And Luca Turin actually talked about it as kind of a, if you imagine a tomato soup, you know, character impact is is the cream 
is not the tomato. And that actually, you know, when it comes to like demand uh, for like new molecules in the market in perfumery, character impact molecules are much more like valued as like novel uh, than like flavors because flavors, there's like hundreds and hundreds known. And for sure, you, you can come up with new ones, but uh, with the ones that exist, uh, there's already so many possible combinations that nobody have ever, has ever tried. Um, Whereas like character impacts, uh, th there's they affect scents in completely different ways depending on the flavor. Uh, for the most part, um, for example, Lina Lol uh, to me is really what Neroli pointed me at first, and it's almost like the whole set of essential oils uh, for the most part is kind of a study on how flavorful molecules get influenced by different proportions of linalol. Uh, I mean, seriously though, like if you take something like humulin or vanillin or I, I don't know, any, any flavorful mo molecule, you add linalol to it, it's gonna twist it and transform it, make it more three-dimensional, make it feel more voluptu voluptuous. It will make it feel like it can actually get to you much more intensely. It will also last longer and it will soften the edges of the harsh edges of whatever scent. Uh, even scents that are like really harsh, you add enough linalol to it, you will preserve a version of the flavor, but without the harshness. Uh, and in that sense, I actually compare these, you know, character impact molecules with a kind of like reverb effect in audio processing. Uh, there's also another analogy, which actually it might depend on the on the particular character impact molecule, which is it's a kind of like brown noise or basically something that uh, it's in the background. And, you know, in a lot of like sounds, like let's say like, um, like, you know, heavy metal or something like that, that there's like a lot of like noise. And by noise, I mean like very flat regions of the spectrum. They also contribute a lot. I mean, they can soften the edges Somebody can be screaming really heavily, but with the right kind of noise and ideally the right kind of reverb, it doesn't sound harsh. Uh, maybe semantically harsh, but not sensorially harsh. Um, and likewise uh, with things like linalol. Now, linalol was, you know, it's like I looked up what was in Neroli. Uh, actually, there was like a bottle of linalol together with a package uh, for this one. And... Um, and Lena Lowell, I just got a bunch of Lena Lowell. I became obsessed with Lena Lowell. I basically every variant of Lena Lowell that you could find, like dehydro Lena Lowell, Lena Lowell oxide, uh, Lena Lil acetate. There's like a bunch of like little variants of Lena Lowell, and I have as many of them as I could possibly have, just to figure out like the subtle differences and in, in what way they influence uh, the influence the smell. And uh, here's the thing, uh, guys. So. You could almost say that Neroli is more or less like orange with a bunch of character impact molecules. So it's almost kind of a perfume already. You know, a lot of perfumes is really taking interesting flavors and then giving them a, a, a character impact uh, profile such that they do something new and, and interesting. And uh, Neroli is almost kind of a perfume all of its own. Um, I've actually, something that I've done is, you know, if you combine a single type of Neroli, with alcohol in a proportion of like, you know, one to five, you could use that as like a perfume. I've, I've done that in, for example, like little bottles like these. Um, if you combine this particular Neroli with alcohol, uh, you will actually get something that is that a top note that is indistinguishable from the top note of the Ferrari uh, Bright Neroli. Um, okay, so, but that's not all. I mean, like Neroli also has a bunch of linalil acetate. Um, and it has like a bunch of other things like geraniol, uh, geraniol acetate, um, and then uh, of course, like the things that sound like Neroli, like Nerol, Nerolidiol, um, uh, what was the other one? Yeah, basically a bunch of things that sound, um, Nerolidiol, um, oh, Neroleone, Neroleone, and we'll, we'll get back to it. So, um, interestingly too, um, there was a time when I was exploring the lemon lavender space. And this is, you know, one of the things that I do is like sometimes I'll, I'll pick something that like combining essential oils. I found something that was really interesting that I enjoyed a lot. And then I just basically started to trying to create a reconstruction from synthetic molecules. 
And that is such a fascinating exercise because it means that you have to really deeply understand, you know, not only by reading uh, studies or like, okay, what did they find in these essential oils, but also just like introspecting very deeply and trying to get the different facets right. Um, I mean, and the first thing I did this with was with lemon and lemon. Uh, if you want to know more about this, uh, I have like a the first part of my Quilia research diary for uh, scents where I kind of uh, walk people through a little bit like what my my process for replicating a lemon, making a realistic lemon was. Uh, and then I extended it to a bunch of other things. Uh, the first combination I did was uh, lemon lavender. And uh, one thing that later on I realized was that Neroli is quite similar actually to kind of not a lemon lavender, but an orange lavender mixture. And the big reason why that is the case is that lavender has a bunch of linalol, like, you know, levels of up to like 40%, and a bunch of linalil acetate, uh, which is another super amazing character impact molecule, uh, up to like 30%. So lavender oil is already like 70% character impact, and then like 30% of other things, m many of which are actually also character impact, and a few flavors. Now, Neroli doesn't have the flavor of lavender. It doesn't have that ring to it. It really, really doesn't. But it absolutely has the character impact of lavender. So it's kind of like take the narcotic, sedative, reverb, voluptuous quality of lavender and add that to an orange type of smell and you will get something that approximates Neroli quite a bit. And um, that's uh, there's one piece of the puzzle missing, though, which is that Neroli also has a waxy character. And uh, that's where like something like Neroleone actually becomes so important uh, to take into account. OK, so um, let me just walk you through quickly like varieties of Neroli, because this is the other thing. Right. Like, on the one hand, you want to make a synthetic replica just to learn it very deeply for yourself. And then uh, you also want to basically explore the space of the natural smells. And and this is also a place where Neroli is very special because the space of orange scents is not that large. I mean, as I was saying, there's like some that are a bit more waxy, some are a bit more sweet, some are a bit more oily. But on the whole, most oranges that I've experienced, orange essential oils, there's like an 80% overlap. But with Neroli, there's like genuinely just completely different clusters that they share the same character impact quality and they all have like a little bit of delimonene at the very least. So like you can tell it's kind of an orange vibe, orange flavor. And they all are somewhat waxy for sure. But then what comes forward as the, you know, the, the foreground of the scent is very different. So this one I consider kind of like a very clean, very clean Neroli is, the sense is my favorite, is the archetypal Neroli for me. And uh, a fun fact, this actually, one of the things that I realized when I was smelling this uh, for the first couple of times is that it gave me a sense of what Coca-Cola is made of. I mean, that's a fascinating puzzle, right? It's like if you're drinking Coca-Cola um, and you're wondering what is in it. And, you know, somebody who's very perceptive may actually notice that nutmeg is an ingredient of it. Because nutmeg is actually kind of similar to, to cola. And actually the cola flavor of Coca-Cola is nutmeg, you know, eogenol and like, yeah, basically things in that in that space. It also has lemon and lime and orange oil, uh, strangely. But uh, <laughs> uh, uh, it also has a tiny bit of Neroli oil. Now, I, I for, of course don't know the actual, you know, secret formula of Coca-Cola. This comes from this thing that is called open colas. Um, you can find it online, open cola recipes, how to make your own cola at home with essential oils <laughs> in tiny proportions. I mean, you're, they're poison in large proportions uh, anyway. Um, not to be confused with Ubuntu cola, which uh, even though you may think Ubuntu because open source software, yeah, no, it doesn't trans Ub Ubuntu cola is actually not a open cola, by the way. Uh, anyhow, this will give you a new way of experiencing coca-cola basically getting it's kind of like when you taste coca-cola and after like a couple minutes there's a lingering acidic 
a slightly oily taste in your mouth still lingering that it's not quite orange but it's in that space i think yeah that this is that <laughs> okay so my other you know second most favorite neroli is this one which is uh i guess it's like from from a japanese uh company and it's fabulous this one i mean the same as, as i was saying like obviously like a bunch of character impact linalol linalol acetate d limonene waxy but it has something else and i would say it has almost kind of like an anesthetic quality um and uh and actually i find it so psychoactive that like when i was exploring it very deeply i i i had to kind of like nap and uh i would become very sleepy without knowing it. And then all of a sudden I realized like, oh gosh, it's because I've been smelling a lot of Neroli recently. Uh, yeah. I, I should also mention that like, you know, I kind of think that to become really acquainted with, with a particular very specific quilia, let's say this Neroli specifically, rather than like Neroli in general, um, at least like a thousand exposures is needed for your brain to really kind of like make a, a bucket for it and start, you know, self-organizing by taking that into account. Uh, now, there's, I would say these three other uh, Neroli oils are kind of in very similar space. This uh, variety is what I would call the jasmine-like variety of Neroli oil. Um, and that's quite wonderful. I mean, like if I was given this without like knowing what it was, I would just think it's jasmine, a special type of jasmine. And apparently, yeah, I mean, some jasminoids are in neroli oil sometimes. And again, it's a natural product, so the concentrations are going to be very different. But uh, I was very surprised with just how jasmine like. Now, when I say jasmine, I do not mean the indolic quality of it. I really just mean the flavor of it. Uh, more or less like the flavor of like jasmine green tea, the jasmine quality of it, that's there's plenty, plenty in these uh, particular brands. Uh, and, uh, you know, for some people, I could imagine that becoming their, their favorite, their favorite type. Um, what else? So there's also this Neroli that I have. Um, uh, you can see the, the brand in there. Uh, Pure Gold Essentials. This one is very strange. Uh, the thing that it reminds me of is green pepper, uh, green pepper or green bell pepper. Uh, just very surprising. I mean, it definitely has the other characters of Neroli, but they're in the background. This is primarily a, a green pepper smell, which is, yeah, so stunning and surprising and strange. Okay, and the last one that I'll, I'll show you today, uh, this one, it says 100% pure. I can't tell that this is Neroli at all. It's just possible that there's this very strange cluster over here. And the reason is that it's like extremely camphorous, uh, basically almost like minty, minty like, but, but with a different twist. And I mean, I think it's just so dominant, like the, the camphoraceous, it's just probably just very potent, a very potent molecule. I'd imagine that even a small proportion just changes the, the smell of it just so dramatically that it's just something else. And you can tell tiny, tiny, tiny hints of like a camphoros uh, facet to the other Neroli's. But, but this one is just basically <laughs> a camphoros facet primarily. Um, so that's, you know, basically, okay, you explore the state space of, of like natural essential oils for, for Neroli. I mean, I still recommend all of them. You, like any one of them would be a nice addition to have for, for quilly enrichment, uh, basically <laughs> achieving that sweet, sweet um, basic quilia literacy we, we all crave uh, and love. Um, now, uh, something that I started to do basically to kind of explore and understand this space uh, more deeply is I also started basically making like, you know, linear combinations of these various ones. Um, various natural neroli uh, oils. And, uh, you know, as, as I expected, actually, even adding a single drop of this one, which is very camphorous, just makes the entire composition just very camphorous. And, and that is one of the things that, um, you know, you may think you're, be do you're doing like some something really interesting by mixing 20 or like 50 different molecules. And sometimes like you think like, oh my gosh, I'm being an alchemist. I'm just mixing all of these, like something really new is going to merge. And when you m smell the mixture, turns out you can only really tell two or three molecules and everything else is just so in the background 
that really just blends together as a certain type of character impact or certain type of like weird flavor direction. So that is definitely an advice that like, uh, if you are interested in exploring the state space of scent, and I suspect this applies for a lot of other things, you have to be very careful about basically how just noticeable differences in concentrations of a given molecule uh, do not map onto you know the actual physical difference in the concentration in the molecule. So just a simple example is like if you mix uh, D-limonene, again, it smells like orange, uh, with vanillin, it smells like vanilla, um, and you mix them in different proportions, you will notice that there's a big region, like up to like maybe vanillin being like 30%, where it's practically just vanillin. It's practically just like vanilla. And then like anything above like 50% D-limonene, it's practically just a, a, a an orange flavor smell. It's really only does like 20% middle point um, where you actually get like this interaction where you get, uh, you know, vanilla orange, uh, <laughs> like orange Julius or what is it called? Uh, uh, dormir soñando or morir soñando. Or so the, yeah, basically all, all of those um, uh, creamsicles, like basically where orange, where vanilla is the secret flavor, which sounds very silly to say, but no, it's true. I mean, when correctly proportioned, vanilla is going to transform in a very unintuitive way basically pretty much anything but again you've got to get the proportion right and if you don't one or the other is going to dominate the same especially when you mix a lot of different molecules generally if they're like mixed at random there's just a few that are going to dominate entirely um, and that's why the state space of scent is actually so interesting and so in a sense uncharted because it, when you're mixing like five or more molecules to get something that is actually unique, uh, what do I call a high entropy scent? You need to basically find what is exactly kind of the, the window of the sigmoidal contribution of each of these different scents and then get it just right for each of them such that in the final product, basically they all simultaneously are perceptible. Um, now, there's a few hacks in here. I would definitely say that character impact molecules actually make the blending of flavor uh, aromas like easier. And also, uh, especially musks, uh, you can mix things that don't mix well or like mix in a strange dissonant way or there's like flickering multiphasic effects. And if you add like a, like a musky accord base to that, all of a sudden, all of those different flavors that, you know, they couldn't, Put, be put together, they actually become like a blended and interesting thing. Uh, perhaps also think of reverb again. Like if you have a lot of um, strange sounds that are just completely different categories, like, I don't know, baby crying and <laughs> a siren over here and like a cello. <laughs> if you add reverb to that, actually all of it kind of blends together into one single interesting sound. Without the reverb, it's just distracting and jarring and flickering and what I call multiphasic. Anyhow, uh, that was just a little bit uh, of, a, of a, a side conversation on exploring state spaces. Uh, but that's uh, what this video is for. So, okay, moving on. Uh, another thing that I tried is Neroli oil reconstructions. Uh, and I have a bunch of them. I gifted a bunch of them away. Uh, but just like I have like four here, just just maybe to, to show around. What my notebook was saying was, I believe, uh, yeah, basically just like take note of the proportions and the comments uh, for the proportions and the comments for all, all of each of the experiments that I do uh, and uh, and basically how they're related to each other. And uh, according to my notes, 154 was the most believable Neroli. And uh, it is quite believable. I mean, this one actually smells like like this one. It's a pretty be believable one. So what did I put in 154? Uh, a bunch of things, but uh, I, I think like the highlights are, yeah, linalool, linalyl acetate in high amounts, D-limonene and uh, valencine, which are kind of contributing to the orange quality. Um, Nerolione, Nerol, Nerolidol, uh, for kind of the waxy, unique waxy, and also the citrusy qu qu character. Geraniol, 
uh, very common in geranium, but also like in rose. Um, uh, and then I got a few things just to make it blend properly. So hedione, ambercore, farnesine. Those are some of those that like allows things to basically like reverb effects. Um, and just a tiny bit of beta pinene, which I think uh, I might not be necessary. I'm not sure. Beta pinene, you absolutely require it if you're making basically a lemon uh, scent. And that's actually something that distinguishes lemon and orange, like whether it has this pine quality as well. You almost kind of think of, uh, uh, especially lime, you know, like lime smell uh, specifically. Um, distinguishes it from like orange or like mandarin or like these other citruses, uh, citrus. Um, yeah, a little bit piney, makes it more like spicy and astringent. Um, for some reason, I added a little bit of that as well for this Neroli reconstruction. I'm not sure if I really needed it, but um, uh, but yeah, it seems to work, work pretty well. Uh, then also, uh, uh, you know, mixtures of natural Neroli's and mixtures of um, molecules. This one, for example, is a you might call like a semi-synthetic reconstruction, which is like, okay, like I'm using some like Neroli's, basically just trying to get the absolutely best Neroli scent possible, which is like not not uh, avoiding using any of the resources that I have. And uh, and it's really good. Um, it has a bunch of linalyl acetate uh, in addition to... Uh, Hedione and uh, and a cleaner combination of the Neroli uh, scents that I have, and uh, yeah, this is quite nice. Um, I don't think it's as good as the best natural that I have, but it's getting pretty close, and it doesn't have any of the kind of like uniqueness of the other ones. It's much more, yeah, really trying to get at the center of mass of Neroli. Yeah. This is good. I wish I wish you guys could could uh, could smell it. Um, okay, and finally, um, I wanted to mention uh, Neroli in composition, uh, and basically with things that you can do with Neroli oil. So, or Neroli reconstructions, either way, <laughs> depending on how afraid of synthetics you are. Uh, but these ones are, yeah, yeah. This was really good. So basically. I remember there was a series of experiments that I did where I was basically finding the right way of mixture, uh, mixing the following three things, which is vetiver, bergamot, and neroli. And here's the thing, like classically, one of the things that I've read from Luca Turin and I think uh, Claude Elena as well, when it comes to like making interesting sense is that uh, good accords are kind of like dominoes that you want to basically find things that overlap in a certain way such that the things that don't overlap can harmonize with the, with the overlapping part. Um, and I found that to be pretty true, especially when mixing naturals, much less so when mixing synthetics. But uh, when mixing naturals, um, I mean, uh, just an example was like the mixture of lemon, lavender and neroli is wonderful. Like, I really love that space. They they balance each other out. The flavors add really well. And it's just so, <laughs> so narcotic. It's <laughs> so narcotic for a scent. Um, it's a, lovely. I definitely recommend exploring lemon, lavender, neroli space. Uh, in this case, I was trying to make something also with more bass notes, uh, which uh, I have to get better at. Um, and I haven't looked that much into how to be make like really good bass notes. And probably I have probably explored mostly top notes and heart notes. Anyway, this one contained also like some base note, natural base notes, and a couple synthetic ones. But basically, it's a vetiver and humulene provide kind of the low frequency background, and almost makes you feel like you're close to a fireplace or something like that, like this woody, slightly burnt uh, quality. Uh, and then like bergamot or bergamot, bergamot. Um, provides an actual citrus and I, I should you know bergamot itself is an interesting rabbit hole um i don't like it as much as neroli but uh, and then yeah basically a, a couple neroli combinations and and the mixture is just very well balanced across the space that said again you could mix one neroli one bergamot one vetiver and 
then do the same thing with different brands and the smell is going to be completely different. And that's one of the reasons why, in a sense, I do slightly prefer things that are completely synthetic because that way it's completely reliable. You know, I can give you the formula. You can make it way over there in a different part of the world and still get the same molecular composition, if not the same qualia. At least, you know, it's our best shot <laughs> at actually getting the exact same qualia. Um, I've also gotten a lot of success with um, Pear and the Rolly combined. I remember that it was like a little bit tricky. You needed this uh, special type of Pear oil. But uh, when you do it well, a Pear Neroli is really fascinating. It's very fresh and, I don't know, alive. Um, and uh, this one is probably just a classic, I suspect. I suspect I, I'm 100% not in any way, you know, revolutionizing the field with this, but it's just very nice, which is Rose and Neroli. Uh, rose as well. I mean, I also have like rose water and rose water is very nice. You can put a little bit of rose water and uh, rub it around your body. And uh, it's a wonderful, very light scent that goes away in 20 minutes. So, yeah, uh, that was kind of a, a big picture account. Uh, hopefully now you know a little bit more about the state space of sense, um, a little bit more about strategies for exploring it. Um, and at some point I will basically make uh, write an article, uh, perhaps also make a video, definitely write an article about my current big picture theory of the state space of sense. Uh, and especially why it's not a Euclidean space. Uh, it actually has a really interesting topology uh, and strange regions of it, especially when you consider the non-linearities that emerge when you combine different character impact molecules and different um, different flavors. Um, the state space is very strange. Uh, and I've mapped out some parts of it and I have a, some idea of perhaps some big picture outline. And uh, really, there's nowhere in the world that you can go to and actually get kind of a summary of what the hell <laughs> the state space of scent actually is. So yeah, I'm very excited to actually show that to the world. Uh, so stay tuned and uh, happy Qualia, happy new year.